Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 134. My guest today is one of my heroes. He has been nominated as one of the 20 most uh, spiritually influential living people on the planet today. And and I absolutely agree with that. Um, when I first was introduced to Dr. Bernie Siegel through uh, taking the training with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is this health coaching training program that I've been in uh, for the last seven months now, when I saw his videos, I uh, wept and wept and wept. I, I just the hot tears of of inspiration and healing were rolling down my cheeks and the whole time I was thinking I want the entire world to hear Bernie speak because uh, what he had to share was just like touched my soul and so um, I reached out to him and uh, and he agreed to come on the show and I I feel like I'm uh, walking on clouds right now it's so surreal to be speaking with you uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing with the Learn True Health listeners about uh, healing and about your wonderful books and, and your wonderful message. So welcome. Thank you, Ashley. You know, you, you made me remember many years ago, if I may get right into something, I attended a workshop because I wasn't happy as a doctor. I didn't feel I was trained to care for people. Well, this sentence says it all. Doctors are trained to treat the result, not the cause. So I used to get blamed for asking my patients what's happening in your life. And when I say blamed, it was, oh, you're blaming your patients for getting sick by asking them about their life. And I say, no, I'm trying to find many ways of helping them to heal. But I attended the workshop, Dr. Carl Simonton, who at that point, this was back in the 1970s, had written the book, uh, you can, I think you can fight, feel, well, maybe it was Getting Well Again was his book. And he was teaching imagery, you know, how Pac-Man could gobble up the cancer cells. And I went thinking, here, this is a, a program run by a doctor to, you know, help empower you to help patients. And when I went there, I was the only doctor in the room of about 150 people. That blew my mind. Here's an oncologist, radiation oncologist, giving a lecture and no other doctor in the whole state of Connecticut was there. But after the weekend workshop, when I got back to the office, oh, I may add this, sitting around me were all my patients. Oh. See, there was no separation now, and I'm perfectly comfortable with them. I think a lot of doctors would have run to another part of the room, you know, but they all gathered around me. And to me, that was a compliment. And one young woman with breast cancer turned to me and said, you're a nice guy. I feel better when I'm in the office with you, but I can't take you home with me. So I need to know how to live between office visits. And that statement literally changed my life because I decided, wow, I'm going to try to help people live from now on. Then nobody's going to get upset with what I'm doing. And I'll always feel better because even if I don't cure a disease, if I've helped you live with it, I've done something. After that weekend, which is why I started to tell this story, I came home, not home, but back to the office on Monday. As I walked in, one of my partners, who's a very intuitive, insightful man who has written books also, Richard Selzer, uh, he looked at me. I just walked in the door. He said, you're gone. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're gone. You're going to quit being a surgeon. I said, what are you, crazy? You know, and and. But that's what he just had to say. No, you're gone. And was he right? Yeah, about 10 years later, I realized I can help more people by talking than I can if I spend the day in the operating room and in the office. And so I started a support group called Exceptional Cancer Patients. My wife labeled the group because I didn't know what to call it. I was looking for some clever title, you know, um, that would have meaning in it. And she said, these are exceptional people. So it became ECAP, exceptional cancer patients. And they became my teachers, you know, that, and the psychiatrists know this, this may sound crazy, 
But when I wrote my first book, I sent it to Dr. Carl Menninger, the psychiatrist who became a friend of mine. He was helping me survive, let's put it that way, with all his books. Um, and he wrote back saying, Bernie, I was about to write a book called 10 Hopeless Cases. It's about 10 people who are supposed to be dead and they're all alive and well, but I'm not gonna write it because you just wrote it. Now you see, that's a psychiatrist comment. And you will find many books now and survival qualities listed in articles by psychiatrists who are helping people to deal with cancer, AIDS, and all host of things. And then they notice that the personality has something to do with their survival. So they pass the information on, trying to help you. As a matter of fact, on my website, it, it's called Immune Competent Personality by uh, psychiatrist George Solomon when he was working with AIDS patients. But again, he wrote down what I had learned. You know, we're all finding the same message. And that's another common theme I say to people. If you find something that is repeated in, in many sources about healing, about surviving, then it must be true because it's coming from many people. One of the things I have on my desk is this sentence from Jesus. It is done unto you as you believe. Now, my feeling is they should have criticized Jesus, say, I'm kidding when I say that, but because if you got sick, you'd say, oh, he's blaming me. See, it must have been what I believed. And if I don't get well, then I didn't believe. Um, and it's my fault. And again, religions, many religions are not a help because they'll bring in the guilt, shame and blame. Uh, it's getting better as the centuries go by. But uh, the Pope in the 1800s told Catholics not to vaccinate themselves against smallpox because God decides who gets smallpox. Well, recently, uh, Billy Graham, who may do a lot of good stuff, but I was shocked by one of his newspaper columns uh, when somebody wrote to him and said, does God want me to have cancer? And his answer wasn't no, it was not necessarily. I thought, what are you talking about? So I read the article and it said that if you deviate, leave the church, uh, you know, become a sinner, whatever, and then you get cancer, maybe you'll show up on Sunday because now you need help. So maybe God could use cancer to get you back. But I love what Maimonides said many, well, about a thousand years ago, perhaps. He said, disease, you know, is not a punishment. It's a loss of health. And if a neighbor loses something and we can find it, we should return it to them. So that's something I thought was very wise, that if you see disease as a loss of health, then we're all here to help you find what you lost. And the other comment he made, which is still true today, well, let me give you a test question, okay? You have eight cats in your house. This is a true story. You and your husband smoke. The cats are developing breathing problems and one develops lung cancer. What would you do if that were your story? I would stop smoking. <laughs> yeah, that's the wrong answer, of course. <laughs> Why? Because this woman wrote the Cat Fancy magazine and said, Doug and I now smoke in the yard. We love our cats more than the convenience of smoking indoors. We're not killing our cats anymore. We hope you're not killing yours. That was in Cat Fancy magazine. Well, when I read it, it stunned me because if I edited the magazine, I would have said, hey folks, take care of yourself. You know, it's not just, uh, just you know, love your cats. And Maimonides, to get back to him, said a thousand years ago, people took as good care of themselves as they do their animals, they'd suffer fewer illnesses. And I think that's one of the biggest factors. Um, you know, the self-love, self-esteem, how you brought up, uh, all these statistics keep popping in my head in studies. Harvard students were asked, did your parents love you? And I can tell you this, you go into an assisted living facility with 80, 90, and 100 year olds and say, did your parents love you? And they look at you like you're nuts. Of course they loved us. I say, that's why you're all alive. Go into high school and say, write a suicide note and write a love note. Why you should commit suicide, why you're worth loving. 
the suicide pile is anywhere from three to five times higher than the reasons for your being loved. And I may add, uh, teachers get upset if I do these things, but actually what happens is the suicide rate goes down because all the kids in the class realize I'm not the only one. I can talk to them about my troubles. I don't have to lie anymore. And it, oh boy, it helps. But at Harvard, they said, while people were still students, did your parents love you? Then they looked them up when they were in middle age. Those who said, yes, my parents loved me, uh, about 20, I think it was 24% had suffered a major illness in the intervening years. Of those who said my parents did not love me, 98% had suffered a major illness. And I think that is over and over again the key, that if you don't have self-worth, self-esteem, self-love, and that includes your life and your body, then you don't take care of yourself. And then many things happen. And another thing that I learned is the solution that all public figures can achieve is to become what I call the chosen parent. And it came from a suicidal young lady in my office that I was really trying to help and keep her alive. Um, and she said to me one day, you're my CD. I said, excuse me, what do you mean I'm a CD? You're my chosen dad. And when we can take that role, chosen mother or chosen father, and let people know we love them. And I always say, it doesn't mean you like what they're doing, but they know that they are loved by you. That gives their life meaning and they start changing how they behave. And let me give you a, a true example. Just so people know, I don't make up anything <laughs> that I say. These are all about people that I know. Um, this is a young woman who, as an adult, wrote a story, a little booklet called Purple. And that's where I came across it and met her. In first grade, the teacher said, draw a picture. So she drew her picture with all the crayons. When the teacher went from desk to desk, at her desk, she started screaming at her. What are you doing? Tents aren't purple. Purple's the color for people who are dying. We're not gonna hang your picture on the wall. In second grade, Mr. Barda asked the class to draw pictures. She was too afraid, so she left her paper blank. That alone, I think, took courage, but she left her paper blank. And then as he's going around from desk to desk, the anxiety in her is just building. What's he gonna do to me? He comes over, puts his hand on her shoulder and said, the snowfall, how clean and white and beautiful. That made her life. And I think that's the part we all have to remember. You know, whether you're a politician, a school teacher, a doctor, uh, you know, if people come to you and you make them feel worthy, then you've done something. So I always say, find the occupation that you want, to, you know, that will make you meet people because then you'll be happy with what you're doing. And I mean it, I, I changed people. One of our sons ran a Subway franchise and I love people. So I started working for him and people thought he was putting me there for publicity, you know, to improve business. But because uh, he was embarrassed when people said, what are you doing using your father? But I wanted to be there because <clears throat> when people came in and they said, okay, we're here for a sandwich. I said, fine, I'll make you a sandwich, but you have to answer my question first. What's your question? What is evil? What can I pray for for you? Who can you love? What's the best day of your life? I have about 100 workshop questions, and I would ask all those questions. And it, it, the funniest part was only therapists didn't want to answer. And people <laughs> would say, I came here to eat, not talk. You a therapist? Yes, how did you know? But everybody else would answer. And then the whole store, so to speak, would get into therapy because some people would still be sitting and eating and then they'd hear a new question and then they'd get involved with that person. Like when one lady said, oh, the best day of my life is when I had my child. And somebody else in the room said, no, you're wrong. She turns around and said, what do you mean I'm wrong? Today is the best day of your life. And then you see, you got therapy going, a new conversation. And um, 
And I said, I do those things wherever I go. You know, I can go into a bank, walk up to the teller and ask a question like that. And um, it, it's just fun and people get to know you and enjoy the contact. And that's the key, that if you don't enjoy people, it doesn't matter what profession you're in, you're going to have a tough time. And I can tell you, none of our children, I thought that this was interesting. The doctor I mentioned, my friend Dick Selzer, and our children, I have, we have five, he had three, none of them became doctors. And I really felt it was because our kids saw the emotional impact it had on us, you know, until we adjusted our lives and really began to take care of people, you know, not feeling guilty if you couldn't save a life or why did God make a world like this? And just all the crazy questions um, that are never answered in medical school, you know, they're becoming a technician and um, it's not about people but he and I struggled with people. And um, I think our kids felt it. Um, they, were, they liked what we were doing as doctors, but they also saw in those days what it did to your life because you didn't have um, you know, a, a cell phone or anything else. So you had to be home to answer the phone and be available. Uh, yeah, we had certain nights where somebody, you know, you weren't on call, but still, your life was focused around being available to help people. And uh, that was something, you know, when they were small kids, hey, we want to go out with you. The other, the neighbors are going out, you know, that kind of thing. And no, I have to stay home. I have to answer the phone. But uh, we, we, you know, eventually integrated a certain night of the week where I was always off and we would go do things. And, you know, you learn how to do those things, but still, I was impressed by the fact that out of eight children, not one of them became a doctor. Um, because again, I think they could see our pain uh, caring for people. I hope you're enjoying this interview so far. We'll get back to it in a minute. But first, I wanted to share a message that has been on my mind to bring to you. You know, I started this journey because I wanted not only to help you experience amazing health, but I wanted to find it myself. And what better way to find something than to learn from experts and also to teach it. Through this last year of doing the holistic podcast known as Learn True Health, I have had the honor of connecting with over a hundred experts in the field of natural medicine. One thing that's really inspired me is there's a group of people, in fact, it's the fastest growing career field in the United States right now, and that is health coaches. I didn't really appreciate them or understand what their role was until after I started interviewing enough of them. And I found that health coaches have an amazing ability to impact someone's life far beyond what medical doctors are doing right now. You see, you might see your medical doctor once you're already sick, right? The old paradigm of healthcare is to go to a doctor when you're sick, uh, wait till your body breaks down or show signs of symptoms, and then you need a doctor's intervention. Not many people, now maybe you do because you're smart and because you're a learned your health listener, you probably do this to some extent, go to a doctor on a regular basis and, and get great health advice from them. Do you go to your doctor and, he, and they t say, hey, you know, I noticed that uh, you could really use more vitamin C and, and I think you should eat this. And, and I really think that uh, based on your body weight and based on your, your blood work, that um, a, a few more minutes of cardiovascular exercise And here, why don't I go ahead and show you how to do it? Why don't I go ahead and, oh, I've got some recipes that are really going to help you because I see in your blood work that you could really benefit from these nutrients. Why don't I go ahead and spend an hour with you and help you do that so we can get you on the right track? No, no medical doctor does that. And if they do, God, hold on to them and definitely tell, tell everyone about them. I don't know any medical doctor that has the ability to sit down with you on a regular basis and not only find out about your your lab work, 
but also find out about your 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 health in every aspect of your life. You see, if you have a really, really stressful job and you have no outlet for that, that can bleed into other areas of your life and, and lead to ill health, right? So what I'm learning about health coaches is that they help their clients to gain balance and holistic health in every area of their life. They come to you wherever you are, whether you're still eating McDonald's and you're 400 pounds and you're sitting on the couch, whether you're uh, driving a truck and and you just don't have time for exercise and you you really do want to eat healthy, but you're always like 100 miles away from any whole foods, or whether you're you know, already gluten-free and already eating organic, and you could just really use some extra advice to take your health to the next level. Wherever you are, a health coach meets you where you are. And then what they do is they slowly add step-by-step the most powerful but, but manageable changes slowly that make the biggest difference in your life. And they, they help you to find out what it is that you need most that's going to make the biggest difference in your life. And so the more I learn about health coaches, the more I realize that we need more health coaches in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in Asia, in Australia. We need more uh, help, this kind of help where someone can be our health advocate, where they can hold our hand, where they can take the time to slowly teach us the things that we wish our parents and our grandparents had taught us, We that the things that we wish we had learned in high school, the things that should be taught in home ec, right? And unfortunately aren't. The things, the lessons that we want to learn so that we can pass these lessons on and these healthy habits on to our children and uh, to our future generations. Now is the tipping point. You may have heard the scary statistic that our children's generation now has a slower, a smaller life expectancy than we do. Can you imagine if if we're meant to live to be, for example, 75 years old, our, our children might only live to be 68. This is very scary. The fact that diabetes and prediabetes, one in three people have blood sugar issues. The scary statistic that one in two men in their lifetime will experience cancer. One in three women in their lifetime now will experience cancer. These are these are statistics that need to be stopped and Only you can do that. So, you know, if you're the type of person that knows that you could benefit from it, I highly recommend checking out a health coach. Now, I am actually in a health coaching program, becoming a certified health coach. And in six months, I will be a certified health coach. And I am absolutely loving this program. I'm halfway through the program. And I'm I'm sending this message to you, not only for those who want to make changes in their life, but I know there's a listener out there who is looking for a new career, who's looking to shift their life. Now, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition was started over 25 years ago by Joshua Rosenthal. You can go back and listen to my interview with Joshua Rosenthal, which, I mean, he is my hero. He's absolutely amazing. I I recommend listening to his interview. He started this actually for women. Now, he has men in his course, in, and, you know, I love seeing and hearing that men are getting into the health coaching field. But Joshua actually started the Institute for Integrative Nutrition for women because he saw that there was an imbalance in the workforce, that women um, had less opportunities 25 years ago to be able to live their passion and be mothers and maybe work from home. And as a health coach, you can do that. You can still be a mom. You can still have a career. You can still be a full-time mom. You can still homeschool. Whatever you want to do, you can fit health coaching into your life, however you see fit. It's amazing. Um, What I also love about Institute for Integrative Nutrition is that they also have a business courses. So not only are you learning how to be an exceptional health coach, But you're also learning how to hit the ground running however you want, whether you want to do full time or part time, whether you want to take on one client a week, a month, whether you want 100 clients. They teach you how to structure your business, how to market yourself in a way that comes from your heart, comes from authenticity, comes from integrity. I have never been more inspired by an institute in my life. So for the listener out there that has been seeking, that has been looking for their life purpose, that 
when they think about the possibility of helping someone, of helping people, they get teary-eyed. You know, every time I think about people who are hurting, that I, I that I could I could impact their life, that I could help them, I just start crying. Uh, tears of joy and inspiration. I want to help people. And so if you, like me, are, are inspired by helping people and you really are passionate, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know anything about health. Um, you don't have to be an expert. That's fine. You, you don't have to have a degree. You can start as a student with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and they'll teach you everything you need. And you can do it in your spare time, do the course in your spare time while you're a full-time mom or while you're working full-time or whether maybe you're still a student. It, I love how they, they really organize and they spent years. I mean, they've been teaching it for 25 years. They've been, they've organized the material. It's all online. So you can be anywhere in the world. There's students all around the world. So if, if, if you're the listener that I'm talking to about wanting to shift your career, or add to your career, maybe you're already in the health field, you just want to increase your knowledge, or maybe you just have a calling and you want to try it out, please check out the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Go to their website. It's IIN, Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Check them out. Give them a call and ask for, you can get a, a download to their, their course, their curriculum. You can even do one of their classes for free to check it out to see if it's, it's a match for you. When you go to enroll, mention you heard it from me, Ashley James, Learn Your Health Podcast, because I have aligned myself with them to make sure that you get a special. I want to I want to hook you up. Any of my listeners who go through their program get a special from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And also, I want you to tell me. I want you to email me ashley at learntruehealth.com. Join our Facebook group, you know, just search Learn True Health in Facebook, join our group. I want you to contact me and tell me you're going through the program. I want to support you in your success. Uh, if you have any questions or you just want to tell me how amazing it is, I have some great listeners that have already gone th- or have begun going through their program and they all love it. And I just, I love uh, creating this community. So if this is something you think would be interesting to you, even if anything I've mentioned is remotely interesting, if you go to learntruehealth.com on the sidebar, you'll see um, halfway down, just scroll halfway down, you'll see that there's uh, in the widget section a place where you can click to uh, get more information about, about the Institute for Integrative Nutrition or just go to their website. Their website was so impressed me because you see all of the teachers that teach their course and uh, you begin to recognize their names and you, and you realize that these are all sort of heroes in the holistic health field and you can't believe that you're going to be learning from them. Um, it's been a dream come true, come true. And and I actually, I've had some of their teachers on the show already, and I'm going to have more. I've, I've, I've scheduled some to be on the show in the future. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my message. Uh, I wanted to take the time to give you this information because I know that there are some listeners out there that are looking for this change now. And they're looking to shift their career to help people to that they genuinely want to make a difference. We want to shift the message from the old paradigm of wait till you get sick and then go to a doctor and get a pill to shifting our lifestyle. So we're living, we're living the most authentic, healthy lifestyle possible so that we can have a, a life that is vibrant, that is full of energy. We can have health freedom right? Don't we want to wake up feeling like we're 18 years old every day, no matter what? And we can have that. So if you want to have that for yourself, get a health coach, definitely get an IAN health coach. If you want to learn how to do that so you can do it for yourself and help others, definitely check out taking the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's health coaching program. It's a certification program. I highly recommend it. And if you have any questions, absolutely feel free to email me. Excellent. Well, enjoy the rest of this interview. When you shared in the the trainings that you did for the lectures that you did for the Institute for Integrative Nutrition for the uh, co- health coaching program, and you talked about this concept of, as a health coach, we need to reparent people. We need to to become like parents again. Uh, 
again, I, I was just, you know, tears were streaming down my, my eyes because uh, what you shared was about, um, you know, the ch ch kids that were uh, suicidal then then no longer becoming suicidal when they, they finally had that reparenting, they had that love. And, uh, and you, this is what you said is um, the opposite of love is indifference, not right. hate, not fear. So if you have been treated with indifference, rejection and abuse, you want to get attention and, and cause trouble. And, uh, right. and you said, you said that, you know, someone would be in your waiting room and might act out like, uh, like light a cigarette in the waiting room to act out. And instead of you going out and yelling at them, you'd go out and, and give them a big hug and that would right. confuse them. But what you were doing is you were uh, recognizing that they were acting out because they didn't have enough love and yeah. that you were there to reparent them. Can you share with us how how can we uh, learn to reparent ourselves and and those around us? All uh, right. I mean, you you're making me smile because I remember people sitting under a no smoking sign smoking, and I would come out and say, "Hey, it's obvious you're looking for attention. Come on in," and they would be stunned, you know, because they were so used to rejection that. You're not going to yell at me. You know, you see that look in their face. You're not going to throw me out of the office because that's what doctors have to realize, too. See, you talked about coaching, reparenting. Coaches don't say, well, these are quotes from a mother to her daughter. You're a failure. You embarrass us. I'm going to dress you in dark clothes so nobody notices you. Now, the daughter, as an adult, wrote, my mother's words were eating away at me and maybe gave me cancer. See, now, if her Mother had said to her, honey, there's a better way of doing this. Come over here. Let me show you. That's a coach. It's not you're a terrible person, but let me improve your performance, you see. And that's something that I began to learn and was able to do with people. And the other was from Helen Keller. Oh, let me give you one more test question. Tomorrow morning, you have to be deaf or blind. Which would you pick? Um, probably deaf. Yeah, that's the majority, except for musicians. But Helen Keller said, I've heard of the stars, the rainbows, the play of light on the waves. These I would like to see. But much more than sight, I wish for my ears to be open. The voice of a friend, the imaginations of Mozart. Life without these is darker by far than blindness. Remember, you would not be talking to me today if you were deaf. You would not be doing all the good things you're doing if you were deaf. And what Helen Keller taught me is how important it is for us to listen to each other and to listen to ourselves. See, because so often when we keep a journal, that's why my wife has helped me so many times over the years. She said to me, there's nothing funny in your journal. She found it one day when I forgot to hide it. I said, well, my life isn't funny. What are you talking about? And then she told me jokes that I told the family funny things that happened at the hospital, but I never wrote them in my journal. And she made me aware there are nice things that happen in your life too. Make a note of those. Because literally, and I mean this literally, we store our memories in our bodies. You can prove this with organ transplants. And there are many books and stories written about, you know, people's experiences. But again, we store them. The psychologists, again, and psychiatrists know this. And so when we have pain stored in us, it creates an environment that will lead to illness. Basically, it's like self-destruction. And psychiatrists, again, have done studies where medical students have drawn pictures and filled out a personality profile. And then she looked them up again 30, 35 years later and found you could predict what diseases they were going to get and what parts of their bodies. It's so much related to our lives. And that's what we have to keep focusing on. So look for your coaches. Yeah, I love one. Um, I don't know what words you allow in this program, but because my wife has a great sense of humor. Um, but I met this couple. The man wore a pin that was the word. Um, oh, dear. Uh, Attitude. My wife just <laughs> told me <laughs> she's a great helper. The word attitude, that pin. And he had cancer. So if he wasn't 
living, you know, like the Bernie Siegel message, she would go over, grab the pin and say, honey, straighten out your attitude. <laughs> and see, that's a coach, you know, and um, it doesn't matter what words I say, because my wife has a fantastic sense of humor, because she said, I said to her one day, hey, honey, you know, why don't you come up with a word? So if I'm making noise, doing things you don't like, you just say that word. And she said, OK, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, I mean, that's why it, but you see again, when you laugh, what a difference it makes in you. So that also the coach can bring some humor into your life and laughter because my wife, I mean, I always say this for other women that, um, if I'm raising my voice, getting angry, she'll say, you're so handsome when you're angry and, and you know, there goes the anger and I'm smiling again. And that's why she's just great. Um, She's my therapist. But anyway, that, that a study was done in Norwegian countries, um, Scandinavian, I should say, countries, where um, people were told to laugh for no apparent reason four or five times a day. And the control group would laugh if something funny happened. And who had a better survival rate 10 years later? Those who laughed for no reason. See, people have to realize your body chemistry is altered by your feelings. So again, you grow up with love. Think about what your body chemistry is, how you feel about yourself. You grow up without love, what is it? And in East of Eden, John Steinbeck said it very well, then I'll give you an example of the testing of your body chemistry. He said, we all experience rejection. With rejection comes a desire for revenge with revenge, guilt, and that is the story of mankind. When I read that, I thought, th those are all the headlines. Why do you go into school and kill people? Why do you drive a car into a crowd? Why do you put a bomb in the Boston Marathon? Those are not people who grew up with love. You know, when you have a reverence for life, you don't act that way. You don't eliminate life, you enhance life. Here's one more test question for you, because I learned from Schweitzer that I was not neurotic and crazy. You go out after the rain and you see several worms lying on the pavement. What do you do? You're taking a walk and the worm is lying there in front of you. What do you do when you come up to it? I, I do this with slugs, but I always throw them back into the grass. Yeah. See, you care about life. And I've been doing that because we always have dogs and I'm walking the dogs and picking up more worms. And I could count thinking you're so neurotic. If people see you, they'll tell you to go see a psychiatrist. But then I read Schweitzer's article in which he said, after the rain, pick up the earthworm, put it back on the soil. And if you see a wor a uh, insect in a puddle, give it a leaf to climb on. And again, he and I have a reverence for life. Our kids grew up with animals, with pets. One of my books is called Love, Animals and Miracles, discusses what I call the Siegel Zoo, because we were always rescuing lives. And literally, I, I mean, we live in a residential neighborhood, but I put fences up and we had all kinds of creatures living around the house, breaking every zoning law, but never reported by anyone because they knew we were doing it out of love. In other words, you were not obsessive compulsive with 97 cats in the house. You know what I mean? That smelled and no, we had all kinds of creatures, but the place was kept clean and neat. And uh, all the kids were, you know, helping to care for them and they cared about life. One of our children is in law enforcement in order. Well, in order to be in the FBI, you have to say that you're capable of killing someone, which is a shocking thing for me to learn uh, his graduation. Um, but one day he emailed me and said, oh, I was at a class and I <clears throat> at the break, I went out for a walk, found a turtle on the pavement. Must have been a male who wouldn't ask, it, you know, for directions. That's his sense of humor, too. He said, so I spent half an hour and I found a pond and released it. Now, you know, when I read that, I think you worried about him having a gun. Here's a guy who spends half an hour to save a life of a turtle, you know? But 
again, all our professions, whether it's doctor, lawyer, policeman, uh, plumber, it doesn't matter. It's how do you feel about people? Why did you choose this profession? And this is something, anybody listening to this, two things, draw a picture of yourself at work, whatever that is, draw a picture of yourself at work, also draw a picture of your home and family. And then the next day, take a look at them. So you're not confused by your consciousness, which will hide a lot of things from you, okay? You know, it's like the next day you notice, oh, I didn't put a head on my, you know, that it, believe me, those kinds of crazy things happen. But then look at it the next day and analyze it. And the other is, if you're going through a problem, be it physical or emotional, ask yourself, how does, what word would I use to describe this problem to Dr. Siegel? If he came in and said, what are you going through? What would I tell him? Now, it's not the diagnosis. If you said cancer, migraine, headache, uh, no, that's not what I'm talking about. What are you going through? Oh, depression, pressure, um, confusion, roadblock, um, failure. You get all these words out of people. Now, some will say, wake up call. It's been a new beginning. It's been a blessing. And I know they're on the right path due to whatever tragic event happened. But when they say things like pressure, failure, what's the pressure in your life? It was her marriage. Instead of being admitted to the hospital, all her pain went away and she went home. <clears throat> failure, what's the failure about? Well, my body, I have cancer, it's, it, my body failed me. That's not my question, how does it fit your life? Oh, my parents committed suicide when I was a child, I must have been a failure as a child. And it's just amazing the words that pop out of people. And I do it for myself, too. Uh, I always remember Joseph Campbell saying, if you're going through hell, ask yourself, what am I to learn from this experience? So when I describe if I'm having symptoms or problems, what am I going through? Then the words say something to me about my life. And then I know what to work on, you know, to take things easy. But... Um, if we keep questioning ourselves, it's all in our consciousness. Um, the intellect is a problem. If all you're doing is thinking, see the thinking doesn't draw the picture. The intuitive wisdom and consciousness draws the picture. And that's why you can predict the future. In other words, if people don't have hands, how do you get a grip on things? How do you reach out? You see, so you're gonna have certain problems. Um, if your arms are in different positions, what are you ambivalent about? What's that going to lead to? So all these things have information in them. And past, present, and future are also in the drawings. Um, I'm not going to try to you know, explain everything with words, but I learned this by doing a drawing for Elizabeth Google Ross years ago. Okay? And my problem was all my feelings. And what's interesting to me, I draw an outdoor scene. I created for a meditation. You know, it's my pure imagination, but I drew it. And the first question was, why is 11 important to you? I said, why are you asking that? There are 11 trees in the picture. Well, I'm doing this work with cancer patients for 11 months. And what are you covering up? Why do you ask me that? Bernie, it's a white piece of paper. You took a white crayon to make snow on a mountain. You added a layer. What are you covering up? And with all my feelings, I mean, by the time she was done with this meaningless drawing, I was blown away with all the things that she's able to help me with. And um, so that's one of the reasons I went back to the hospital and started handing out crayons to patients. And then I thought I was discovering incredible things because you, when you know anatomy, literally people will portray anatomy in their drawings. I mean, streams could be blood vessels. Um, a tree and its branches were the liver in another case. Uh, a tree was a man's brain because all the branches, the way a brain looks with all. I mean, I could go on and on describing. Sails on a boat are obviously breasts, um, the way they're drawn. So it was just amazing. And um, 
all the people at the hospital who thought I was nuts really were taken away by all these things. And I did a lot of children's surgery, so it wasn't hard to get kids, especially, to do drawings. See, adults, it's all the guilt, shame, and blame. I'm not an artist. I have my 10-year-old draw this for you. Uh, you know, I'm trying to help you with cancer, and you're worried about getting a poor grade in uh, art. But it's just incredible. And it's, again, the absence of our education. Carl Jung interpreted a dream and diagnosed a brain tumor maybe 100 years ago. I don't think any medical student has ever been told that while they were going to school. And I thought, that's a sin. You know, you should be able to say to your patients, what are you dreaming? Matter of fact, let me give you one more dream from one of our books, A Book of Miracles, that are not miracles, if you know what I mean. There, there are no coincidences, as Elizabeth Cooper Ross used to say. A woman goes to bed at night. In her dream, a dark-skinned woman with an accent appears and says, you have a lump in your right breast, you need to get it checked. She wakes up, examines her breast, there is a lump, goes to the hospital, they diagnose her with breast cancer. And then they said to her, the doctor who will be running your treatment will be coming in in a few minutes. A few minutes go by, the door opens, who comes into the room? A woman doctor from India, who is the woman in her dream. Wow. Yeah. And I've had dreams about <clears throat> not having cancer when I had symptoms and all my surgical partners were worried about me and why I wasn't hurrying up to get examined. And, and that night in the dream, I was running the support group for our cancer patients. And I said, OK, everybody introduce yourselves. Why are you here? And when it came my turn to say who I was, they all said, but you don't have cancer. No, I mean it. I woke up knowing I don't have cancer. You know, I may have symptoms that could be caused by cancer, but it's something else. And um, that's the part that impresses me, you know, using that inner wisdom. So I always say to people, draw pictures, pay attention to your dreams, because that's coming from a deeper sense of wisdom, if you know what I mean. Um, so when people draw pictures, they may draw a treatment they don't want looking beautiful. And I'll say to them, this is really good for you. You're worried about it. See, it's what they're thinking. Well, like the commercials on television, you know, they tell you what pill is good for, but then they tell you it could sterilize you, kill you, give you a heart attack, uh, diabetes, you know. They tell you it can give you 10 different diseases just to cure your headache kind of thing. Um, but when people draw the picture, say, and that pill or that chemotherapy look beautiful, you know, or the radiation is coming from God, um, I say, don't worry about it. You'll do beautifully because you know intuitively what's the right thing for you. But when you draw the devil giving you poison, I'd say you don't want to do that. Or you have to reprogram yourself. You have to start doing visualizations where you see yourself getting the treatment and doing beautifully, uh, you know, more as it being a gift from God. Um, and then that will alter how people experience the treatment and also alter their drawing. Because one lady drew this horrible black box in the operating room, and she's lying there all alone on an operating table with only two legs. I said, don't go. No, I want to. I want to. I said, then you've got to reprogram yourself. And so she went through imagery four or five times a day, picturing a wonderful experience at the operating room in the hospital. And a week later, the drawing is beautiful. I mean, the room is filled with surgeons and anesthesiologists and healthy colors. There's a window in the operating room with God's light. Her family's all standing right outside waiting for her. I mean, I don't worry about it. Oh, and there are now four legs on the table, you know, that type of thing. Um, so I could say to her, go ahead, you'll do fine. And believe me, the mind is incredible. Because nurses used to say to me at the hospital, your patients are refusing pain medication. I said, did it ever occur to you? They're not hurting. They thought I was nuts. You know, you've operated on them. You made, you know, major surgery and you're telling me they're not hurting. But what I learned again was, and one of the articles, I'm pretty sure is on my website, deceiving people into health, because I realized how powerful my words were, or for children, the words of their parents too. 
in getting them to believe. See, so I lied to children, especially for their benefit. And they were the ones who taught me to do that because doctors, first of all, are not trained to talk to people. And one of our kids, which I don't think was an accident, came home from school with an art uh, campus that he had done. <clears throat> the word words written uh, and filling the whole page. And you'll notice words, words, words become swords, swords, swords. And I thought, wow, you can kill a cure with words, you can kill a cure with a scalpel. And I mean that literally. Um, and I began to pay attention to what I said. But what woke me up one day was saying to children in the emergency room, you go to sleep when you go in the operating room. What am I thinking about? You know, anesthesia. So you don't worry about pain or anything happening. What do you think happened when we wheeled the kids in to the operating room? <laughs> they fell asleep. <laughs> they fell asleep on the gurney, that little, you know, cart that you wheeled them in on. And the operating room, I mean, became a joke. I mean, everybody burst out laughing. Here comes Siegel with one of his sleeping children. Yeah. And the funniest one, I never forget this boy. When I said to him, you go to sleep and you go in the operating room, in the hallway, he turned over on his stomach and fell asleep. When we got in the operating room, I pick him up and I turn him over to get his appendix out. And he started screaming. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You told me I'd sleep. I sleep on my stomach. What are you doing? And we all burst out laughing because he took me so literally. See, I sleep on my stomach. So I said to him, I can't get your appendix from the back. You'll have to turn over. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but that impressed me. They, they told me I'd sleep and I'd sleep on my stomach. But that's why doctors have to learn how powerful their words are. And parents, too. I would tell parents, in a sense, to lie to their children, meaning that if you took a bottle of vitamins and wrote on it, hair growing pill, anti-nausea, pain, um, and if their kid said, oh, I don't feel well, here, this will take care of everything. And believe me, you know, when your parents are doing it, 80% of the time, you don't have any problems taking a vitamin and you don't need a whole bunch of drugs. And you can even give them a pill and their hair doesn't fall out. Um, you see, the power, I mean, I've heard some of these stories from doctors who were upset because they did not realize that a medical error had occurred and that they were not treating their patients, say, that the nurses made a mistake. So in a, one case, no chemotherapy is being given. In another, the radiation therapy machine was repaired and at its monthly inspection, there was no radioactive material in it. And the doctors felt horrible. But I said to them, look, stop feeling so guilty. You're not the problem. The problem is your patient's mind. They thought they were being treated, so they all had side effects of the treatment they thought they were getting. And I mean it, I thought some of those doctors were going to faint because it never occurred to them how powerful that their mind was. I mean, you're lying on an x-ray table, your skin gets red and the tumor shrinks and you're not getting radiated. Now, on the other side of the coin, I have patients of mine who have been radiated with those side effects. So they were checking the machine and found out it's fine. And the woman said, yeah, I get out of the way and I let it go to my tumor. You see, that's again where the mind becomes a part of this and what you're seeing. When a graduate student used actors, he gave them a script and then drew their blood. One was a murder, one is a comedy. While they were acting out the murder, the immune function went down, stress hormone levels went up. While they were acting out the comedy, immune function increased and stress hormone levels went down. And I felt very impressed by that because you're just talking about actors. You know what I mean? It's not their life. They're simply reading a script. But again, I've learned it does affect the actors. If you're in, uh, what was it? Death of a Salesman years ago. I forgot uh, who was playing the role, but he couldn't make it through the winter, you know, without getting 
respiratory infections and so forth and having to drop out. It's because of the role he's playing. His immune function ain't doing too well. But when you're in a Mel Brooks, you know, production, like the producers or something, uh, you, you stay on Broadway for three years and you don't drop out because you're having a wonderful time every evening uh, going to act out in the play. And that's why I say when you get back to the people laughing for no apparent reason, and I always suggest that to people. I test myself on these things. You go out for a walk in the morning and just laugh for no reason and watch how you feel after a few minutes and how hard it is to stop chuckling. It just, you know, sort of infects you with humor and you feel better. And that's why I mentioned how, you know, my wife will come up with statements and as soon as the two of us laugh, there's nothing to fight about. Um, I got to tell people one more, well, two more things. One was one day she came home from shopping and um, had to run to the bathroom. So I went out to the car and I just emptied out all the groceries and everything, put everything away. And then I'm in the kitchen waiting for her to come in and say, oh, you're the best husband in the world. And she comes in and says, honey, what? You don't put tomatoes in the refrigerator. <laughs> so I, I, I was upset. You know, I do all this and I get criticized. So I wrote a poem called Divorce. About <laughs> all, my, all my bad habits, including, you know, eating fast and putting tomatoes in the refrigerator, things like that. And I read it to her. And of course, at the end, she burst out laughing. And then the poem is changed to end with, I love her when she laughs. So we take the tomatoes out of the refrigerator and we fire the lawyer, you know. And again, it's, it's those moments that you don't forget. But this is something important, though, the word relationship, because Joseph Campbell called marriage an ordeal. I was surprised to see that in one of his books. Why would he say that if he's married, an ordeal? But several women were talking to my wife and they said, what's it like to be married to him? I could hear them say, ask her. And I heard her say, it's a struggle. And they all stepped back, you know, and I was nodding my head because I knew what she was saying and what Campbell was saying. A relationship is not about two individuals. It's about a relationship. Campbell said one plus one equals three. You know, you're creating a third entity. And I think that we've always been focused on that. And the same is true, whether it's a doctor and a patient, um, you know, or a plumber and uh, the owner of the house. Uh, you, you have a relationship. It's not just the work that's being done, but it's the interaction between the people. And when the interaction is correct, then the work always ends up coming out that way too. And the best way to know, <clears throat> good doctor, good plumber, good anything, is to ask them this. Are you ever criticized by patients, or let's say the people you work with and for, your family, and for doctors, it would be patients and nurses. So the people you work with, the people you work for, and your family, do they ever criticize you? What do you think the good doctors say? I think they'd say yes, because they're That's listening. Right. Yeah. The best ones always say, yeah, yeah. And I say, that's the way, if you said, I'm in a strange town, I don't know what doctor to see, I'd say, go, when you go in, ask that question. And if they say yes, stick with them. If they say, no, I'm not criticized, then say, thank you, I'll find someone else. Because I learned from the nurses, because I used to think it was a bad sign. They were always telling me how to behave better in the hospital. And I said to one of them, what am I, the worst doctor in the hospital? Why do you ask that? Because everybody is always telling me how to do something better. And she said, no, we know you care. So we tell you and you listen. We don't talk to the doctors who make excuses or don't listen. And that really impressed me. So I learned to be criticized. Again, it's back to when we talked about coaching. They know from their experience what's the best way of doing it. And they tell me and then I can do that. Wonderful. 
you have so many amazing books and i know right before we hit record we were talking about my my listenership which i have this great uh, audience i have i have several uh this um group of healthcare professionals uh, everywhere from naturopathic physicians and mds to massage therapists and health coaches and then uh we also have on the other side of the spectrum we have we have listeners every day who are finding our podcast because they're suffering and they're looking for answers they're they're looking to heal on 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 some level either they've had a chronic condition or they were just diagnosed with something and so they're seeking uh, and you, you you shared with me that the two books that you've written that uh, that healthcare professionals should read is um, your first book which is love medicine and miracles and uh, a more recent one the art of healing right can you speak to speak to our listeners who are healthcare professionals? What what message would you like to leave them? Uh, and and you can definitely point out well, things in your books. Oh, I know. <laughs> no, it, it, you know the, let me just mention the art of healing is literally about the art. I <clears throat> I was thrilled when the publisher put sixty drawings in, so they can see the specific examples. You know that I'm talking to you about. <clears throat> and uh, learn the techniques and what every color means for that matter. See, purple is a spiritual color. And there are times where people may say the drawing, I mean, the treatment is divine, so it's in purple. But at other times, there may be a purple butterfly on the page saying, I'm leaving, or a purple kite floating up in the sky. And I can let the family know that they're ready to go. And in one case, to tell the man, you need to let go of the kite because the, the, his wife drew the picture and he wasn't ready to let go of her. And she was a lovely lady. So she said, all right, I won't die, I'll train you. Because he said, if you die, I'm dead. I don't know how to do a damn thing. So she lived another three months, trained her husband until he said, I cut the string. If you need to go, it's okay. And let me mention one more, which is sort of heartbreaking too, but helpful. When you have a four-year-old who has cancer and the mother just was fighting so hard, and I don't mean that fighting in, in a negative way, because as Mother Teresa said, I will not attend an anti-war rally, but if you ever have a peace rally, call me. But she was fighting to heal her daughter, not fighting cancer and a war. Um, but the, her daughter drew a picture of this purple balloon um, draped in black with lots of colorful dots all around it. And again, interesting. On the same page was a face of a child crying in yellow and green, which are perfectly healthy, natural colors. And I said to her, Amber, what's, you know, this? And she said, oh, that's not me. That's a child in the next room crying. And that fascinates me. How does the child know to switch colors? You see, it's that intuitive meaning. But anyway, I got her mother to take her home. And a few weeks later, Patty called and said, Bernie, Amber woke up this morning, said, Mom, I'm dying today as a gift to you to free you from all your troubles. And she said, it's my birthday today. And when we counted the dots on the page, those were the days left in her life. So believe me, all this is is known within us and we can help each other, you know, with that kind of uh, symbolism. And then I know you asked me a question and I got off on this story. <laughs> What was it you had said that got me it's, going? It's, it's totally fine. Um, your your two books uh, that are best uh, recommended for healthcare professionals, it, Love, Medicine, and Miracles, and then the one you just spoke about, which is The right. Art of Healing. What I'd recommend for all health professionals is to get sick. Now, if you don't want to do that, just get admitted to the hospital. Okay? Or, which also works, put a bandage over your eye when you go to work. All these things have happened to me. Um, I became a better doctor after spending time in the hospital and you realize what they're experiencing. Uh, when, you know, serious diseases are diagnosed in our family. Yeah, one of our seven, when he was seven years old, he told me, you see, this is the intuitive wisdom. Here's a seven year old says, my knee hurts, I need an x-ray. I said, take a hot bath. What do you mean you need an x-ray? No, I need an x-ray. He had a bone tumor. And from the x-ray, it looked like it could be a sarcoma, lose your leg, probably lose your life. Next day, he came to me and said, Dad, what is it? You're handling this poorly. That's a seven-year-old telling <laughs> his doctor, you know, father. 
because he hadn't had the surgery yet or anything. I said, what are you talking about? He said, look, we want to have a nice day. You're worried about next year. Stop telling us to sit in our room and be depressed. Let us go out in the front yard and have a nice day. And he had a very rare benign tumor. But I learned a lot in the week before his surgery. He was my therapist, let's put it that way, a seven-year-old. And the animals are, are similar. They don't worry about next year. But when you have a visible wound, people tell you things they never would tell you otherwise. So you could have cancer, go to the supermarket, but who the hell knows you have cancer? But you have a bandage over your eye in the supermarket. And I mean this literally. Everybody talks to you and asks you, what happened? How are you? And tells you their story. And one doctor down in Sloan Kettering, Sidney Winnower, in his book called Healing Lessons, it's about his wife having cancer. <clears throat> I was sent a copy. And when I'm reading it, I see this sentence. I want to apologize to Dr. Bernie Siegel. So I stopped and I called him up. I said, what are you apologizing for? You have never done anything that would upset me or bother me. What are you talking about? He said, Bernie, I was apologizing for what I thought of you. Now that my wife has cancer, you're an enormous help. Okay? And that's what we have to realize. What are people experiencing? Help them with their experience. But if you're a tourist, you don't know how to help the natives. And, and that's what you need to keep learning. What are you living? What are you going through? What's happening in your life? Because last, maybe this is a good closing, so to speak, when people accept their mortality and then really begin to do what they love to do, you call up a man who moved from Connecticut to Colorado. Actually, I was calling his family because I was very angry that they didn't invite me to the funeral, which I said I wanted to come to, because he was given a couple of months to live and said, I want to go die in the mountains. It's beautiful there. A year later, I call up, very angry about not hearing from them. And he answered the phone. <laughs> and I said, I was calling your family to ask why I wasn't invited to the funeral. And he said, oh, it's so beautiful here, I forgot to die. Okay? That simple statement. And another millionaire uh, down in uh, Miami that I helped out, <clears throat> because his son had read my books and wanted to help his father. And, you know, when people are after you that way, I know they're survivors. I, I got to talk to him. And um, he said one of the things he did was cancel the dress code at work. No ties, no jackets and suits. And he told all his employees. Mm -hmm. Then his wife said, let's buy the house on the ocean we've always wanted. You can listen to Bernie's tapes and meditate. And he was given a couple of months to live and he lived for over five and a half years. Um, and the nice part was the hospital knew it was him, if you know what I mean, not their wonderful treatment because they didn't expect that they had anything to offer him. And for him to live five and a half years, they knew damn well he had something to teach them. And I can't wear a tie anymore because of him. Um, every time I look in the closet, I, I, it's just no. <laughs> I'm not worried about what other people think, you know, how I'm dressed. My wife worries, but I don't. But um, it's just, you know, I want to be me and, and just to do that. And I'd say that to people, you know, live and give your children those messages too. Uh, do what makes you happy. God is redirecting you. Something good will come of this. And material things are to make it a better world for everyone not just to have a bigger house and more money and, and especially for the men to get that through their head. I know guys who die because of this. I can't work anymore. What's the point of living? I mean, those are quotes and their wife and children are sitting right next to them when they say it. I can't work anymore. What's the point of living? I know men who have committed suicide when they were told you can't work, sail your boat or play tennis anymore. And to go home, put a gun to your head because of that. And the women, the nice part for the women who live longer than men with the same diseases is they'll say things like, oh, I have nine children. I can't die till they're all married and out of the house. <laughs> she lived for 20 years and then her cancer came back. 
See, as a doctor, that's the part that blew my mind. As long as she was mama, she lived. But you need to have your authentic self, not just a role. See, that's one of the survival qualities, that you're not living a role. You're not the wage earner, the mama, the, you're living an authentic life. So when the kids leave home, you still have your life and you keep living it. So maybe I could, in a sense, list immune competent personality. It's on my website, but the basics are, you have a sense of meaning in your daily activities. You're able to express express anger appropriately in defense of yourself. And that's important at the hospital. Don't want to be a good patient. You can ask friends and family for favors and help when you need it. Um, if you get depressed, you use it. You don't say, oh, depression is no good for my immune system. I heard doctors. No, you use your feelings to help guide you. You have play in your life, like the humor, the laughter. You make decisions about treatment. And as I said, you don't live a role, you live an authentic life. And don't wait for a disaster to get you to say, well, I never wanted to be a lawyer, I'm gonna go play my violin. Yeah, I know a lot of people are alive because they got a job in an orchestra, <laughs> you know, and then didn't die. Uh, they're no longer a lawyer. And I will close with this, if it's okay with you. The, the aspect of how medicine separates people into compartments like you do a house. If you have an electrical problem, you don't call a house doctor, you call an electrician. But the body is like that too. I sent articles to medical journals when I thought I was discovering something incredible with all the drawings and different things. And the articles were sent back saying, it's interesting, but it's not appropriate for our journal. I thought, oh, right, I'll send it to a psychiatry journal. So I sent it to a psychiatry journal. It came back again. It said, yes, it's appropriate, but it's not interesting. We know all this. Okay. And, you know, Carl Menninger, my friend, wrote a book called Ten Hopeless Cases, but he didn't publish it because he said, you just wrote it when Love, Medicine, and Miracles came out. He said, I just wrote a book about 10 people who should all be dead and they're alive and well, but I'm not going to publish it. You just wrote it. That's the craziness, you see, how medicine separates the us as people into, okay, you need a heart doctor, you need a neurologist, you need a, you know, endocrinologist. And it, it, but we're a person, we're a whole unit, and you need to treat the person and the unit and their life, and not just um, the mechanical aspect. And to every doctor who listens to this, draw yourself working as a doctor. That's in my book, The Art of Healing, too, because out of, say, 100 medical students, one extreme, he drew a picture with not a human being in the picture, books, computers, medications. Then you have 90 eight pictures which show the future doctor sitting behind a desk with a diploma on the wall. No patient in the picture either. And then one that really touched my heart. He's kneeling in front of a wheelchair with his arm around the patient. So he's like fused to her and handing her a tissue. See, the stethoscope is hanging from his neck, but he's not listening to her heartbeat. He's handing her a tissue. He's, out of that whole class, the only true physician who's taking care of her needs. And that's something that I've learned. You know, it's not a joke to say to people, how can I help you? Um, versus, here's a pill for your disease. One ad from Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, New England Journal of Medicine. I'm depressed, unable to cope. I went to see my physician. He prescribed antidepressant. I feel better now. I wrote to the magazine and to the pharmaceutical company. I said, excuse me, I've had a real tragedy in my family. I'm depressed. I go to my doctor. He says, here's a pill. Don't you think he ought to say what's going on in your life? Why are you depressed? And they canceled the ad because all I asked them to do is put in a line that says, sit down, tell me what you're going through, you know? And instead of that, they canceled the ad. 
And um, I get very upset with a lot of things. Just wrote the American College of Surgeons because I don't know if they've ever changed their pledge. But years ago, I learned the pledge said, because I'm a member of American College of Surgeons, it said, um, I will deal with my patients as I would wish to be dealt with if I were in the patient's position. And I thought, what the hell are you talking about? You know, why don't you say I will care for my patients as I would wish to be cared for? I said, if you go buy a car, you expect to get, you know, be dealt with from a dealer, but you don't want to be dealt with. And they let me write an article called Surgery, Mechanical or Healing Art. And this is probably 25 or so years ago. Uh, At least they published it, that article. But, you know, we need to think about the fact that we're caring for people. And that everybody dies, so death is not a failure. And if you help them to die, as I have done with a lot of people, um, yeah, I feel better and they feel better too. Uh, Instead of withdrawing or separating yourself or feeling guilty or becoming a Jack of Orkian and saying, oh, well, if I kill people, I'll be in control of death. I mean, we need to know ourselves. So whatever profession you're in, ask yourself, Why did I choose this profession? What are my healthy reasons? What are my unhealthy reasons? Um, And then you'll help yourself to become a happier person. And last but not least, no matter what profession you're in, you put your desk against the wall. So when people come in to see you, they're not separated from you. You're living the same, you know, you might say threats and possibilities as they are. So whether you're an accountant, doctor, lawyer, or whatever, don't separate yourself from the people uh, who come to see you. And it'll confuse them at first. Because I would have people come in and say, this doesn't feel like a doctor's office. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Because of all the things I would have hanging there and paintings. Yes, I've got paintings around me as I talk to you. Um, The consultation. It's Jesus, a doctor, a nurse, and a patient in a bed. The nurse has medications. Jesus is gently putting his hand on her head, and the doctor is sitting there with his chin in his hand, thinking. And then there's one called, um, oh, the do- it's called The Doctor, that I have literally seen. It was hanging in London by Sir Luke Fildes. And in it, that's above me here, <clears throat> A child, and it's a true painting, this child died on Christmas Day, and the artist painted the portrait and picture. The child is lying on two chairs with the pillows on them. The doctor is sitting next to her with his chin in his hand, and the parents are behind the child, the mother crying and the father holding the mother. Now, why didn't the doctor say to them, pick up your child and embrace her? Even if she's going to die, let her die in your arms. See? And one doctor said to me, oh, look, the child's hand, he's, she's reaching for the doctor. This is a limp hand hanging down towards the floor, not up. And if <clears throat> the doctor had feelings, why didn't he grab the kid's hand then? But I know of, and so do most doctors in this field, uh, premature infants and so forth, who when... The parents were told, your child is dying, doesn't have to be in isolation, intensive care anymore. You can hold your child. The kids have come back to life when mama puts them against her bare breasts. One kid literally started suckling from the mother and blew everybody's mind because they thought, you know, she's basically dead. So here, mama, you can hold her. And the kid came back to life. So all those things are possible. And I keep thinking of more stories. Um, The power of the mind. I promise I'll stop after this, though you can't trust me. (laughs) (laughs) But this was a patient of mine from our cancer group who became pregnant. And I got a call one day. I'm in premature labor. I'm going to have a miscarriage. I'm just, you know, she was just such tragic, everything in my life. So I ran over to the hospital, and when I walked into her room, in the labor room, it was horrible. 
I mean, I could feel the panic and fear and, and just pain of everybody. And I just yelled at them. I mean, I don't know. I just took charge. I couldn't stand it. I said, get out of here. Everybody, get out of here. They looked at me like I was insane. So they ran out. The nurses, doctors, everybody, her family ran out of the room. And I shut the door and I went over to her. I said, look, let's communicate with your body. Let's tell your uterus to stop. And we went through meditation and imagery of picturing the uterus stopping, having a full term birth. And, and as we're talking and doing this in the next 15, 20 minutes, her labor stopped. Everybody came back in the room and was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, about six or seven months later, I get a phone call. Bernie, I had a little boy. So we're naming him after you, but we're Irish. So his name is Brady. And, you know, I never forget that moment. It was such a beautiful gift when you have something like that happen. And, uh, and, and, you know, we all, when something like that happens, you pass that love on and that gift on, and then you help others. And that's exactly why I wanted to have you on the show when I first saw your, your first video in um, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's training. And you held up a piece of paper with a big black dot and you said, what is this? <laughs> and you said, this is a white piece of paper with a black dot. And uh, what you were alluding to is that everyone walks around with wounds. And this was an example, a black dot sort of, we all walk around with, with the wounds. And he says, no, no, your quote was, nobody is free of wounds. Don't ever forget that. And therefore don't hide your wounds. And I think that's when I, began to cry and I did <laughs> and I cried for the entire time you talked because I I've felt my whole adult life like um some people can like I've thought this before you know if someone's depressed you can't see that person's wound it's they're suffering on the inside or if someone has diabetes and they're they're suffering emotionally or mentally and along with their physical illness you can't see it and for me i've um i've struggled with weight my whole life and at times i felt like it was a blessing because people can see my struggles on the outside they can i go well look look there's her wound but and sometimes i felt like it was a curse because i didn't i wanted to hide it but when you said that it, it, it freed me because i realized that if someone can see my wound on the outside and and then then i can help them too because they'll open up Right. And uh, so when you said that, it, it moved me so much because um, I all I want to do is help is help other people and uh, inspire them. And it, well, remember this, they have to want the help. So don't feel bad when people don't do all the things you'd like them to do. I mean, they have to show up. That's the thing I've learned. That's why my wife came up with that term exceptional patience. I send out 100 letters to patients with cancer saying, you want to live a longer, better life, come to a meeting. 12 women showed up. So remember that. It's not that you're a failure or not doing it right. They have to want to show up. So you're the coach, but if they don't come for practice, nothing happens. And the other is, I use the term, the curse becomes a blessing. And I'm glad you reminded me of that black dot because in New York, say you hold up a piece of paper with a black dot and say, what do you see? A black dot. <laughs> That's more typical of New Yorkers. They're seeing the troubles. But I said, but you know, charcoal under pressure could become a diamond. Yeah. And when you meet healthy people and you hold up a piece of paper with a black dot, I said, what am I holding? A piece of paper with a black dot on it. Why are you asking that crazy question? Yeah, because they're not focused on only their troubles. So remember, the curse can become a blessing. You see, again, it's the labor pains. One woman compared nine months of labor, you know, her pregnancy, to 12 months of chemotherapy or radiation. And I watched my body change, tired, I sit staring out at life. I live within my mind. Books and music transport me beyond my body. Nine months pass, I give birth to my child. All the discomfort and pain is now justified. And the same poem ends with 12 months finally pass, I give birth to myself. All the discomfort and pain is not justified. So keep making it a labor pain, and then you keep growing. 
That is so beautiful. Thank you so much, Bernie, for coming on the show and, and sharing this wonderful information. Uh, it moved me to tears, and I, and I hope it has touched the hearts of my listeners. And I wanted to let my listeners know that you can uh, gain access to so many amazing books and so many great articles by going to BernieSiegelMD.com. And uh, in his books, I, I'd like to list them. Love, Medicine, and Miracles, How to Live Between Office Visits, Prescriptions for Living, Help Me to Heal, 365 Prescriptions for the Soul, Smudge Bunny, 101 Exercises for the Soul, Love, Magic, and Mud Pies, Buddy's Candle, Faith, Hope, and Healing, Words, Swords, A Book of Miracles, The Art of Healing, and love animals and miracles and i am expecting more books from you <laughs> to come yeah the interesting thing is you talk about hope um the only c i got in four years of college was in creative writing and now i have all these uh, books that i have written and I, I may add we didn't really talk about that i talked about humor but it's a childlike sense of humor my first book, Love, Medicine, Miracles, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So I wrote to my college, Colgate, and I said, you know, if you now give me a B in creative writing, I would be a summa cum laude graduate. And I'm, I'm laughing. You know what I mean? I'm making <laughs> a joke. But I got this, you know, this very serious letter from the uh, academic, you know, staff at the hospital saying, we're not allowed to alter grades after you graduate. And I thought it, it was to me, that was sad that they didn't laugh, you know what I mean? And get a kick out of me. Instead, they think I'm really trying to raise my grades, you know, 30 years later. Um, but you see in town, I do crazy things. So everybody knows me. If I call a Chinese restaurant and order a pizza, they immediately say, is this Dr. Siegel? And if I call the pizza restaurant and order Chinese, they say, is this Dr. Siegel? And I've had so many funny, wonderful, well, even calling the veterinarian. Uh, hello, do you take care of alligators? And the technician said, is this Dr. Siegel? <laughs> so I began to realize everybody knows how crazy I am, but they laugh with me, you know, and, and then we all feel better about each other and can put up with each other. So keep the child in you alive that childlike sense of humor it's never rude it doesn't upset anybody it just gets everybody to laugh that is wonderful now you did share with me that listeners could uh, when they buy a book one of your wonderful books yeah. from your website if they put in the code 36 that they could get a discount um what's the symbolism behind 36 no it's just some numbers it's just a code because uh, some of our family um, takes care. They have a store called Wisdom of the Ages dot biz, where they have lots of healing things, including all my supplies. So if the order goes to them with the number 36 in it, um, they know you get a 15 percent discount and where it's coming from, you know, that type of thing. OK, wonderful. Excellent. So listeners can definitely go to your website, BernieSiegelMD.com. And of course, that link and uh, some more great information will be in the show notes of today's podcast at LearnTrueHealth.com. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, and and teaching us. And uh, anytime you come out with more books in the future, you're welcome to come <laughs> back and, and share and promote them. I'm 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 forever grateful that you um, are here to, to teach us and help us to remember that we need to uh, to turn um, curses into blessings. Right. Well, you know, most people see you didn't have a, an exact limit. As people can see, I never stopped talking, but they'll interrupt me and say, Bernie, we're running out of time. And so my message to everyone is we're all going to run out of time. So enjoy your lifetime. Enjoy what you heard today on your episode of the Learn to Health podcast. Did something move you, inspire you? Did you get great information that's going to change your life? Awesome. That's exactly what I'm here to do is to help you gain your health back. Please turn around and share this. If this is something that's helped you in any way, share this with those you love. Love the Learn True Health podcast and want to support us? Awesome. You can go to takeyoursupplements.com and you can support us that way. 
you'll get access to amazing supplements that are just really great quality for a great price. And there'll be someone on the other end of the line to help you pick out your supplements that are right for you. That's takeyoursupplements.com or join our membership learntruehealth.com slash join. That's another great way to support our podcast, support our movement, and you'll be supporting yourself. Gain more information, wonderful videos, wonderful trainings, and you'll also be able to share those with those you love as well. So go to learntruehealth.com slash join. Want something fun for free? Go to learntruehealth.com and right there on the front page, you'll see where you can get our free cookbook. I spent a lot of time making it and it was so much fun. It's really delicious, healthy recipes. And you can also get our seven day doctor course uh, right there. It's seven days of naturopathic videos sent right to your inbox and you can learn from top naturopaths on how to gain health naturally. So that's takeyoursupplements.com for wonderful supplements. LearnYourHealth.com slash join to join our awesome membership, which is only open for a limited time. You can get our free healthy cookbook and you can also get for free seven days of wonderful naturopathic videos sent to you. Just go to LearnTrueHealth.com and you'll see it right there on the front page. Thank you so much for being a listener and thank you for sharing and helping others. Let's spread this information and turn this ripple into a tidal wave. <laughs>